Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Facts Don't Matter, the only game show where facts don't matter. We are now on the last question with Ken with 2,000 points and Andrew still with zero points. That's all right, Andrew. The last question is worth 2,500 points. So if you answer this correctly, you can win the whole thing. Here's the final question. Who hates women more, Islams or Christians? Andrew, you buzz first. Uh, Islam uh, is far more misogynistic and anti-Semitic than white male Christians. I'm sorry, Andrew. While your answer was correct, it offended Kent, so he gets the points. The correct answer was Trump must be impeached, which means Ken wins a free trip to Los Angeles. He gets to hang out with liberal SJWs all week long and listens to them complain how Fortnite should be called Fort Alt-Right because you play as a privileged white man running around building and shooting things. That does not sound like fun at all. Until next time, mindless robots, this has been Facts Don't Matter. Out of place, we ain't caring about your feelings, yeah. Anytime, any place, you can feel it here. Steven, then you out of space, so we clear the air. Any topic, and it's safe, so just be prepared. Don't assume, keep it straight, we might keep it fair. Fuck the news, fuck a page, we gon' keep it real. If you tune in, then you sick for real. Fuck a Bluetooth, we took the red pill. Every image on the video, talk about it. Different views on the subject, we might talk about it. At the end of the day, we just talking, homie. Only me in the room, but it's like a party. Introducing... Stephen Daniel, author, artist, all around great fucking guy. I don't know about you all, but I'm getting tired of this shit. You know, this 2020 shit. I was looking forward to being able to go outside with other humans without fearing for my life. I went into Barnes and Nobles the other day because reading is fucking awesome and saw this ugly looking dude with who I assume was his wife. They were looking through books. They kept approaching where I was standing, and I swear, I felt like I was going to have a heart attack. A whole store to walk around in, but nope, they had to go near me. Those two weren't even wearing masks, and the guy had a cough. I shit you not. My heart started beating faster and faster. I, I, I mean, I hate wearing those things too, but the pointless things keeps us all at ease, right? But then something happened that I've only seen in movies. I had to decide what I was going to do quickly. Rather than a devil and an angel appearing on my shoulders, I had Robocop. Somewhere there is a crime happening. And the Terminator. Hasta la vista, baby. And they were not advocating for a peaceful resolution of conflict. Thankfully, those two people went on in another direction, possibly to spread their fucking fill somewhere else. Now, 2020 is a fucking horrifying year so far. We've got a plague, which changes our public spaces from places of recreation into places that feel like death traps. I miss Disney like crazy, but even with all this protection and new rules, I still ain't going until maybe next year. There have been human rights violations throughout the U.S. We also have a president who talked about shooting his own citizens. People he swore to protect is now his fucking cannon fodder. I get what he meant, but the fucker could have said it better. And his opponent's only resolution is violence with a side of more violence. Sometimes I just want to spend all my waking hours in Red Dead Redemption 2 online and ignore the whole world. Sometimes I do that, but the times that I don't are the times that I'm talking to you lovely folks and trying to better my situation. What I'm trying to say is that I'm tired of this situation, and it's not just a me thing. This is a everybody's thing. You're fucking tired of this thing. I'm tired of this thing. We're in this together, and that means we've got to take care of each other. Today's touchy topic, we're talking about you being you and not caring about other people's bullshit. Uh, for the fun topic, we are talking about Disney changes in Disney parks and how I agree with the change of the Splash Mountain theme. And we got a whole lot of fun stuff in between. Let's get started. Time to get touchy. Get ready to be triggered. Sensitive topics. Oh, look, they're about to cry. All consensus, we'll see. Nobody likes a snowflake. What is Steven's problem today? I want to talk about you being you. Let's start with what got me wanting to talk about this. The other day, I overheard a conversation at Walmart. These jackasses in football jerseys were making fun of people who watch other people play video games. They made it seem like it was a stupid thing to do. They also said that it was the laziest thing someone could do. And it reminded me of what that used to be funny Jimmy Kimmel guy said about how watching people playing video games is like going to a restaurant and having someone else eat your food. This argument is stupid. People that say this shit don't realize that they do the same thing. They watch people play sports. 
watch people drive cars. They watch people cook food. They watch people build shit. They watch people garden. They watch people eat food. They watch people go to court. And they just watch people talk. All those talk shows, they just watch them talk. Same fucking thing. I watch people play games. I do. Even though I'm a gamer. I love to see people play the same games or other games that I don't play. But I watch people who are entertaining and that can make me laugh. I watch many gamers, but my top four are H2O Delirious and Cartoons when they both play together. It's hilarious. I love watching Hummies VR comedy. They improv a lot while playing VR games and they have made me cry laughing several times. I also enjoy Tales of the Grim. It's a Dungeons and Dragons type of game, not a video game, but the players are always fully committed and I have laughed and cried many times watching them. A couple of days later, I saw a post on Instagram of someone eating a hot dog horizontally. I saw this and I was like, wow, that's different. Never saw somebody eat, eat a hot dog like that. I can't do that myself as my beard would get all messy. And I hate hearing my wife say, you got something in your beard. I began getting frustrated at the comments. People were shaming the hot dog eater for eating it differently. Nasty comments that probably made the hot dog eater depressed and hurt or for showing how quirky she was, how different, and had fun with it. But when you read the comments, you just feel bad for her. Days later, I saw this clip on Twitter that said, was so bored, I watched this. The title of the video was, I am a wolf with Naya Akomi. She explains why she is a wolf in a human body and did some wolf stuff in the video. I thought it was weird as fuck, but I was super happy to see people who aren't afraid to do what they love, doing it without fear of judgment. As long as they're happy and she wasn't going around biting people, I didn't care. Today, there are not many people who know how to just let loose and be happy. Too many Karens and Kens out there. But the comments were horrific. I got really frustrated with people who had nothing better to do than to make fun of her. And just last week, I was looking at a newspaper, online newspaper, fuck paper, and I noticed something when reading the headlines and ads. They were telling me how I can change. You know, the, the overall vibe is how can I change other people's mind? And, and the more headlines I read, it, was, it kept saying how wrong the world is. Nothing in the newspaper said what was right in the world. And that's when I realized that the world is constantly telling you, uh, telling all of us how we should be instead of being yourself. I said, fuck them. And now I'm talking about it. Many people spend most of their life trying to please everyone. Sometimes it seems right to protect your true self or your thoughts and feelings because there are many stupid, violent people out there that will make it unsafe for you. So you have to be secret on certain things. And it sucks like secretly being a Trump supporter or secretly hating Brie Larson. Some of you follow the trends and hide amongst the mob. You want everyone to be happy. You want people to like you. You do everything you can to please these people. And then what happens? You realize that what you have been doing did not make anybody happy. No matter how hard you tried, you couldn't please others. You became miserable. People around you made you feel like maybe you were an alien from a different planet. You felt alone and depressed. Many times growing up, I felt like I had been placed with my family as an experiment to see how someone would grow up with people who uh, barely even shared the same language, you know, like the same stuff that I did, think the way I thought. It was so different from my family. Nobody got me, and most still don't. Why do we care so much about other people's opinions? Why do we care what total fucking strangers have to say? Why are we afraid of what other people think? When was the last time you did not do what you wanted to do because you cared more about what other people thought of you? The answer is sad. You probably care more about what others think than you like to admit. I don't know if it's because I'm 34, but I am now much more confident and I don't give seven fucks what other people think about me or if they had a problem with what I had to say. This is why I started the podcast earlier this year and not before. Many people in my life never hesitated to give their negative opinions about me or opinions of how I look. With social media now, people can hide behind a profile and have no problems being cunts and letting their opinions fly like the wind. Listen, you can't make people like you. Most people who are quick to shame you and leave negative comments under an alias have pretty shitty lives. Think about this. Why would someone who is happy and living a great life take the time to do nothing more than be hateful? People who are quick to judge me and fight me over stupid things. I start to think that maybe 
something is deeply wrong in their lives. Like there's a like there's a core problem. Something's fucking wrong with them or they're struggling with something. Their hateful comments and reactions are a reflection on them, not me. It's fucking sad that some people have nothing better else to do than to waste their time trying to tear other people down. Remember that story I, I told you about a friend in episode two? Well, before that, I used to have a shirt fuse. I had a fake side and a real side. That event made me realize that my fake side that pleased everyone was getting me into trouble anyways, no matter what I did. So I said, fuck it all. Well, now when I receive unconstructive criticism, hateful comments or text messages from shitty family and friends, I no longer get upset. I don't take their fucked up opinion of me to heart. I take pity on whoever is choosing to spend their limited time on this earth spitting hateful shit. If people you surround yourself with have a knack for starting drama, avoid them. If they have a tendency to tear you down, then separate yourself and be rid of those toxic fucking people. If you have a public life on the internet like I do, just laugh off the terrible comments. That's what I do. If it wasn't for, you know, my author career, it wasn't for the podcasting, I would be rid of all social media. I would. You can't stop people from being hateful, but you can choose to ignore them and do something better. Keep in mind that there are going to always be people that are going to dislike you no matter what. And there is nothing you could do about it. Don't waste your time trying to get them to like you or talk to you if they stop talking to you. Spend your time and energy living an awesome life. Use your talents and gifts that God has given you and have fun, damn it. Let other people like you, not because of who you're trying to be, but because who you genuinely are. If you want to live a fantastic life doing what you love, surround yourself with people that are like you. There's a phrase I remember seeing online, your vibe attracts your tribe. It means that the only way to attract people like you is to be yourself. If you are pretending to be someone that you are not, you are only surrounding people who have nothing in common with the real you. I deal with this type of shit with my family. I used to be someone I am not so that I don't have to always walk on eggshells. But later on, I realized that no matter what, those people will always see me as the enemy when the real me gets exposed. It just tells me that they just don't like me. Best thing I ever did was say, fuck them. I have friends who are more family because they accept me for me. How do you find people like you? First important thing is to be yourself. Do things that you love to do. Are you a gamer? Do you only like playing RPGs? Find other gamers online who play the games you play and play how you play. There are many forums and groups out there. You can find one. Are you a cook? Go to places like Sir La Table and take a fun cooking class to meet others like you. Are you a Disney Park fanatic? Of course, you can always talk to me. Or find an online community like Michael K. had made and enjoy Disney news together. You need to break out of the shell and learn how to talk to strangers. This was hard for me growing up. I was always really shy, and it took my father to make me go up to a store clerk or anybody and talk to them. I had to be forced. Being shy and scared of being myself, man, I missed out on many opportunities because I didn't want to get to know people. I wrote people off too quickly. No matter what you're interested in, there is an online community out there filled with like-minded folks just waiting to meet you. I've always heard, you know, oh, there's an app for that. There's an app for that. Well, you can say the same thing. There's a community for that. There's a community for that. Where can you find these communities? You can find communities and groups all over online. Look for group pages on social media networks. Look for YouTube channels that cover things that you like. Look through apps like Meetup and look for podcasts that talk about your interests. There's always going to be a group of people that are like you. Once you join these communities, you have to learn to be engaging. Being an active member is what will make it feel like an awesome community. Don't do what you did when you started kindergarten. Don't just stand in the corner and stare at everyone. Introduce yourself and get to know people just like when you started a new job. It just starts with a, hello, my name is. Start liking and commenting on posts. Provide your input where you can. You will start enjoying the conversations you were hoping to find. Listeners, another thing that will help is this. I want you to get in touch with your inner child. This will help you be you. One of my favorite stories growing up was Peter Pan. Peter Pan is a free-spirited, mischievous young boy who can fly and never grows up. When I was a kid, I promised myself to never become a boring adult. I remember my mom walking into my room when I was playing action figures with my little brother. He is seven years younger than me. So we would take all of the action figures, and our room was a huge city. We were also into wrestling, so you best believe that I had Spider-Man yelling, Do you smell 
what Spidey is cooking. And he whipped in the Undertaker. Anyways, she came in and told me that I was 12 years old and too old to be playing with action figures. My father, stepmother, mother, stepfather, uncles, aunts, and grandparents did not care for video games. It was something that we had to grow out of. As you know, I never stopped doing that. Still gaming. I'll be 80 years old, but I'll still be playing video games. Today, people like to bring out their Disney nerdom when attending a Disney park or an event like D23, but it wasn't like that when I was a kid. Besides a boring Disney t-shirt and maybe a hat, you wouldn't catch adults getting decked out in Disney gear. Now, there are so many options for adults for Disney freaks like me, and I love it. Basically, what I was taught in school and at home is that being adult is fucking boring, and it is something you just have to deal with. They would say, hey, well, you still got sports. I gave everyone a hard time growing up. I refused to grow up, and I, but I didn't know when it was time to be an adult. I was friends with young and older folks, and people would say that I have an old soul, that my thinking was beyond my years. I know when to work and when to play. I know when to be serious and when to be silly. No matter how much responsibility I was given, I never got rid of my inner child. You've heard me talk some serious shit. I read the newspaper online. I watch the news. I get overexcited for some new furniture or some kitchen shit. Boring adult shit, yes, but I still play video games when I have alone time. I got an Xbox One X and a PS4 Pro. After I buy the two new consoles coming up this year, I plan on buying the Switch and a good PC so I can play all of the exclusive. Every Sunday, I play with my three boys with video games too. Right now, we're playing Minecraft Dungeons together. I still watch cartoons. I'm currently binge watching The Simpsons since I had only watched a couple of episodes in the 90s. But I love all the adult cartoons like South Park, Rick and Morty, Big Mouth. I also watch cartoons with my kids, the stuff that they like. Right now, we're watching Gumball, Gravity Falls, and Breadwinners. I play toys with them. They got Legos and Hot Wheel cars up the ass. I mean, all the boy shit you can think of. I buy them the cool shit that I wish was available when I was a kid. Growing up, we couldn't build forts because it was my mom's house rules. And in our room, we didn't have enough blankets and pillows and she wouldn't let us use the extra shit. Well, guess fucking what? This is our house. And my wife and I can build and do whatever the fuck we want. We've built the coolest things as best as we could. And our boys love it. They love when we play with them. I grew up watching superhero cartoons and reading comics and seeing them come to life. It's fucking awesome. And as an adult, I just buy the tickets and me and my oldest are watching the newest superhero movie together. Unless it's something like Deadpool, then I have to be the responsible adult there. Anybody that knows me personally knows that I am a special kind of silly fuck. I am as silly as can get. You hear me serious, you hear me screaming, but I, man, I can get really silly. I just love making people laugh or cringe with my weirdness. The point that I'm trying to make is that if you're not being bold, like a kid is bold, if you're not doing things that you really want to do, you are not living a fulfillment life. When I watch my boys freak out over bubbles, I am so amazed because they're just excited over something so small. Just like when I heard the ice cream truck growing up. It was an awesome feeling of, of the rush and excitement that everyone got in the house. We didn't care how shitty the ice cream was. It was just all exciting. Just listening to that stupid fucking tune. Embrace your inner child. Bring that shit back into your life. Be creative in writing, drawing, or create shitty music. Or good music if you're talented. Eat the same stuff you did as a kid. Your inner child don't give a damn about your keto diet or the vegan shit you have in the fridge. Eat that candy you loved as a kid. Eat a bowl of fucking Fruity Pebbles. Play board games again like Monopoly or Don't Wake Daddy. Get nostalgic with movies. Who gives a shit? My sons are at the age where I can watch movies with them that I loved as a kid. We just watched Homer Bound and the next one on the list is Sandlot. As adults... We tend to overcomplicate things. Everything has to have a fucking reason. Everything has to have a purpose. The child within us can teach us to solve even the most burdensome problems. If you listen closely, listen, your inner child is trying to communicate with you. Just fucking listen. Our inner child will never leave us. Most adults forgot about their inner child as they grew older. Listen, your inner child can help you with being yourself. Let's wrap this up. Cue the cheesy music. Why can't you be yourself? So many people have tried to go outside themselves in order to impress those around them that they don't know who they are anymore. They have not taken the time to create their own identity. They have to be a certain way or portray a certain image so that people can like them. You are no longer connected with yourself. You just blend right in. 
Social media is a big factor in that. It created a society that feeds off of how other people look at you. How many little hearts you get? How many thumbs up you get? Today, the biggest influencers for kids are friends and the social media star. All that matters right now is likes and positive comments. Don't let that dictate your life. It is okay to be yourself. It is a right to be original. It is a right to have your own opinion. When the world says, if you watch this, you're cool. If you wear this watch, you're cool. If you use this wallet, you're cool. If you use this makeup, you're cool. If you agree with celebrities, you're cool. If you like anything Beyonce does, you're cool. If you like Brie Larson's fake new YouTube channel, you're cool. Listen to me. It is okay to not like any of that. It's okay to be yourself. It is okay to not follow the trend. Growing up, I was told you can do anything you want. That if you wanted to be successful in life, you needed to be yourself. I used to think anybody who said that was full of shit. Now, I started looking at what it means to be successful. And I started realizing that if you want a happy life, you have to be yourself and not let others change who you are. Keep in mind that there is no such thing as guilty pleasures. Take the guilty out of the guilty pleasures and love what you do with no shame. Whether it's watching Disney films and other cartoons as an adult, streaming shows and films all day long, playing app games like Homescape, ordering takeout food multiple times a week because you don't want to cook or you just had to have that one more slice of cheesecake from the Cheesecake Factory. Whether you're reading nothing but TMZ, whether you're stalking your crush's social media account, whether you're staying in your pajamas all fucking day, whether you're stealing soaps and toiletries from hotels, whether you're eating a tub of ice cream to yourself, whether you're eating breakfast or dessert for dinner, loving pimple popping, watching reality TV, sleeping in on the weekends, taking naps every now and then, watching porn, dancing like no one is watching, taking too many selfies, not following diets, flirting with strangers, hoarding clothes, loving songs like Space Jam or Shake It Off, loving movies like Independence Day and Mrs. Doubtfire, loving shows like The Tiger King or Once Upon a Time, loving games like The Sims or any Lego games, pretending to house hunt, being addicted to TikTok, vacation planning two years ahead. Keep doing these things. Things that people said that it's, you know, those are guilty pleasures. Who gives a fuck? Keep doing things the way you want to do them. Whatever make you happy. I mean, I could go on. Whether you like when you're playing a game and you stop at every light at GTA like I do. Whether you want to have a fucking affair. Whether you're singing in the shower as if you were a star. Whether you want to cosplay and meet with other people who do the shame and pretend that you're that fucking person who cares. Whether you're treating your pet as children. Whether you're putting things on, in, in an online cart and never buying them. Whether you're pretending you're in a music video when you've got your headsets on. Whether you're staging a fictional conversation. I do this all the fucking time. When you're staging a fictional conversation between you and other people. Whether it's family, friends, and enemies. You know, you're practicing an argument in your head. Whether you're just being a fucking wolf. Or a furry. Or being an adult baby. No matter what it is. No matter what your quirk is. Your sexual fantasies. No matter what it is. You be you. Doesn't matter what others think about your political views. Doesn't matter if your personal life choices. Your career goals. Your choice of being single. Your choice to not having children. How you spend your money. Or how you procrastinate. It doesn't matter. You be you. Be you. Do what you like. Doesn't matter. Doesn't fucking matter what other people think. Don't change it to someone else to please others. I learned that the hard way. There are other people that think and act like you find them today we have access to the internet that has a whole mess of online communities with people that are just like you if your friends family and co-workers don't like you don't like what you do or find what you do not interesting or weird fuck them i have missed out on many things because i was surrounded by ghetto fuck nuts and uptight prissy pricks that i thought i had to be like them be you none of us know what change is because none of us don't have a damn fucking clue who we are find out who you are explore do the shit that you want doesn't matter how fucking weird it is see i don't care about what other people think and how they want me to change and neither should you take responsibility for your happiness and live a life that makes you happy a person that you like do things that make you smile that is why I sign off the podcast telling you to smile. That is why my email signature is smile and then my name. Be yourself and do good, you know? 
That's all you have to do when you're doing your weird shit. As long as you be yourself and you're doing good shit. That's it. And you're not hurting anybody. It sounds fucking corny, but as long as you don't bring harm to others physically and mentally, there is nothing wrong with you being you. This is your one life. There are no do-overs. Your story, his story, her story, my story, end the same way. Death is inevitable. We all will die. It may be cringy to hear it out loud, but it makes it easier to stop caring so much what other people think. And you can learn to be true to yourself. Follow your own path. Follow your intuition. Take the information that you, you know, were taught from great teachers and others who are like you and work it in a way that works for you. Do me a favor. I want you to wake up every day and don't be like celebrity A or celebrity B. Don't be like that Instagrammer. Don't be like your friends, siblings, or parents. You need to be 100% you. The first song we're going to listen to is Shelter in the Storm by Megan Pools. It's cold again tonight, but I'm gonna be alright, cause I have you. shelter in the storm you keep me safe and warm oh i won't ever feel the chill our hands are holding tight to get us through the night oh you're my shelter in the storm oh That was Shelter in the Storm. Other songs I like from this artist is Light After Loss and Three Christmases. If you want to check out those songs and more from Megan, visit her website. The link is in the description. If you like all theme park shit, really long lines, bland food that tastes like your grandmother's armpit, overpriced entry fees, untrained teenage stuff, dangerous rides, and really long lines, well, guess fucking what? Out of Place has got you covered. The latest news for all you Fast Pass lovers, Here's the Not Another Theme Park News Show. Let me shut the hell up and introduce your host, Britt Nolan. Hi, friends. How's it going? Have you started color coordinating your masks with your shoes? 
Have you attended a pilot program of an amusement park that's reopened? Did you find out shortly after that some kid working there the same week you attended got plagued with COVID? And then you felt like you were having symptoms? Okay, well, I'm glad most of you are safe. For the rest of you, I hope you don't die. But your immune system says if it's not COVID this year, you'll be sure to get HIV from Winnie the Pooh next year. It's only a matter of time that your kinky theme park escapades will catch up to you. At that point, I'll make sure to include you as a bullet point in this segment. Now for the news. Fuji Q Highland, located just outside of Tokyo, reopened last month after its virus shutdown. The park asked riders to avoid screaming on the coaster to prevent the spreading of mouth mucus, and instead to scream inside your heart to garner support from the masses. They asked riders to put on their most serious face for the ride photo and share it online in the hashtag keep a serious face challenge. Participants have the chance to earn another park day pass. This challenge is set to end July 17th. So hurry up or at least go take a look at the photos online if you want to see what a serious man looks like on a coaster. It's brilliant, poetic, and rumored to be the premise of a future coming Shia LaBeouf movie. I'm gonna go ahead and skip to a horror story real quick to keep that theme of international news going. And next time I hope to have an actual agenda to use going forward versus this sloppy shit pile of random. But don't count on it. In France, a 32 year old lady died at Parc Saint Paul in Oise, France, about 50 miles north of Paris on Saturday, July 4th. Freedom! She fell from a roller coaster. The fatal incident occurred around 2 p.m. that Independence Day, not celebrated in France, but you know, here in the States, and it occurred on this ride called Formula One. She was pronounced dead at the scene. The victim was reportedly at the park with her sister, husband, and mother to celebrate her two-year-old child's birthday. She went over the safety bar and her husband actually tried to catch her by the foot. Well, he didn't actually do a good job and uh, I'm sure he'll feel like a failure the rest of his life, missing the big catch, saving his wife. And that's a pretty morbid story. And one shitty ass birthday for that baby to look upon for years to come. Damn, sad. Right now, there's not really a publicized reading on how this occurred. However, this incident comes more than a decade after a 35 year old woman died of cardiac arrest after she crossed the safety barrier while on that same roller coaster and was thrown off the ride. Park was not held liable in that lady's death and an investigation reportedly said the victim had acted inappropriately and it was all her fault. Whatever the hell that means. I mean, inappropriate? What was she like, flashing her tits? Anyways, the Formula One roller coaster is one of 45 rides at the park and requires riders to be at least four feet tall. I guess one death in every 10 years seems like a risk that's worth taking. I'm in! The spring 2020 Disney College program ended abruptly due to exactly what you would expect. <laughs> in both Disney Resort in California and Walt Disney World in Florida. And more recently, Disney officials canceled the upcoming fall 2020 Disney College program. Disney said they had no choice but to cancel the college program for now, as student housing is still shut down on campuses because of the upcoming election fraud. I mean, a uh, pandemic. Bullshit. In an email, the company told students who had already been accepted that their offer of employment had been withdrawn, but that they would receive a full refund for their program fee. Wait a minute, they actually had to pay for that shit? I mean, damn, they've got some good little slaves. On a brighter note, these same grads are now eligible to reapply in the future rather than just right after college. A link in the message prompted students to complete an online information form if they wanted to receive updates about when the internship would resume. The decision came a week before Magic Kingdom and Animal Kingdom were scheduled to reopen in Orlando on July 11th. This was the first time these parks opened in about four months. Epcot and Hollywood Studios are expected to reopen Wednesday, July 15th. The reopening occurred during the claimed resurgence of cases in Florida, but Florida Governor Ron DeSantis didn't want to disappoint his granddaughter on her birthday and he said, what the hell? You can reopen. Everybody reopen. I mean, bars, you stay closed. But Disney, come on, freaking reopen. And then the California governor, Gavin Newsom, says, We don't need to open this shit. Birthdays are for pussies. So Disney World, 
will remain closed indefinitely, but, you know, go on down to Florida. It's funny because, like, uh, it was back and forth last episode, this episode. You're hearing myself contradict because the world is contradicting itself right now. But we got some fun news. With the reopening at Disney World, Splash Mountain, that racist ride mentioned in last podcast, was actually one of the most popular rides for all those mask wearers. Guess what? You assholes did it. That change.org petition really stirred the pot. And they will be retheming it from Song of the South to The Princess and the Frog. Was it a hit because that crowd wanted to ride in the style of racism one last time? Or was it because it was hot as balls and people just wanted a little splashy splash? I don't know, but apparently all the souvenirs are selling out for that shit. So, uh, yeah, if you want to sweat it out, go down to Florida and have your one last time in that theme. Otherwise, it's going to be the same ride with a freaking frog and a black chick. One of the bright notes about Disney World reopening is that most of the rides had significantly reduced wait times. Flight of Passage, an Avatar-themed ride in Animal Kingdom, had only a five-minute wait and was said to be closer to a two-hour wait pre-pandemic. There are many other things to be said about the park's reopening that highlight the downside, but I want to end my Disney talk on a somewhat happy note. You aren't the type of person that needs to cry over no parades, no autograph signings, They're all canceled because, you know, you can't stand near anybody except when you're waiting in line for a ride. All right, so let's go north, north on the map, and we're going to stop at Grand Island, New York, home of Fantasy Island. This park opened in 1961, and it closed in February 2020 after the park entered a new 15-year lease agreement with Empire Adventures. They shut it down just before it would have been forced to shut down anyways, with the intent that they would beautify the park grounds. They plan on opening the summer of 2021 with some old rides, some new rides coming out over the next five years. So there's not much to say other than don't blame this park's closing on COVID. It would have closed because of COVID, but not because of this. So uh, shut your bitch mouth. Quit blaming everything on COVID. Sometimes shit happens. I'm just joking. You could blame that on COVID if you want to. Anyway, there is another theme park that closed that we also can't blame on COVID. Except it did close for COVID, but then it reopened last month. And that is Joyland, located in Lubbock, Texas. On July 9th, a storm occurred that had wind speeds between 80 and 100 miles per hour. People were able to vacate the park safely, except one employee that got injured from falling debris. Even though attendees were okay, park officials must look into fixing the overall park. There was damage to several rides, fallen trees, and collapsed power lines. That will take many days to get the park ready for visitors again. That's right, many freaking days. And the park's owner, David Dean, says he hopes to have the park reopen again by the end of summer, as long as the second wave of COVID doesn't strike. So even though it's supposed to take many days, uh, they're gonna just gonna push it off because it's too fucking hot to do the labor. Let's now end this with something that we can blame on COVID because that is the theme so far since beginning this not another goddamn theme park news segment. There is no real news. With most theme parks opening at limited capacity, most theme parks don't have the cash flow or the comfort needed to be whipping out new rides, flair, all the latest toys and gadgets or stuff to even wet your willy. They are hesitant to invest and give people more to look forward to when they can't even guarantee how many park goers they can welcome and what crowds will actually feel safe to attend. With that being said, Six Flags Jersey Devil Coaster won't open this year, but will wait until 2021 for its debut. The single rail RMC Raptor was slated to open up this summer at Six Flags Great Adventure in New Jersey, but construction was delayed due to the coronavirus limiting their capacity to service at full volume. Theme park chains have been slashing their capital budgets following the COVID shutdowns across the country, which has resulted in a tourism crash. SeaWorld management has suggested that it might even delay some of its yet-to-be-open 2020 coasters until next year. And Cedar Point, this is the fucking worst one. They will not be having their 150th anniversary celebration on its 150th anniversary. They're planning on postponing it till next year. And they might as well make it 2022 because uh, this shit storm looks like it's not going away. You know, see how long you can drag it out. Anyways, what are the options? What news can I give other than bad news as usual? This is inevitably what I signed up for. Maybe you will get some news next year when the election's over and people are sick and tired of being sick and tired. Yeah, I copied that from that movie that I can't remember, but I love it. 
This was recorded in my aunt's dorm room. Ugh, she's got a lot of panties. And I await to tell her the bad news of saying that she cannot be a part of the fall Disney college program and she will never get to live out her lesbian fantasies of sucking Donald Duck's dick while simultaneously scissoring Daisy Duck in the employee cafeteria. Wish me luck. I hear footsteps coming in now. And thanks for listening to not another goddamn theme park news segment with me, Britt Nolan. Monday, 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 it's our third annual Grandma Fighting Championships. Our champion Gertrude the Bulldozer Bennett will be defending her title against newcomer Dorothy Dagger Dick Daniels in a cage match. Thyroid glands won't be the only things acting up. Backs will be thrown out, short old lady hair will be pulled, and exposed saggy titties will be swinging. Come on down and bring the whole family to witness this absolute bloodbath. And while you're here, don't forget to try our dollar tequila shots and our all-you-can-throw hot dog special. GFC title fight Monday! We are not responsible for any injuries, lost items, or erections lasting longer than four hours. Don't be shy. You think about it all the time. You don't have a dirty mind. You just have a sexy imagination. Now, it's time for sex talk. Steven is right about you being you and not being afraid to do so. Let's take that a step further and apply it to couples, specifically sexual fantasies and role play. I am not talking about the role play you see at Comic Con. No, the role play that happens at the hotel room after Comic Con, when your dreams of gagging Princess Leia and making sweet, thunderous love to Thor. Exploring each other's sexual fantasies and role playing can help spice up a relationship when you are tired of the same pillow talk, the same vanilla positions that don't always seem to hit that spot. Sexual fantasies can increase sexual desire and arousal. It can increase the frequency of orgasms and sexual satisfaction. And it helps you with erotic focus, meaning that you won't be thinking about cooking, gaming, errands, or work bullshit. You will only be thinking about what needs to be done. Because once that arousal intensifies, you will automatically forget all about that unimportant shit. If you're worried that when you are on a fantasy adventure, your partner will want to do it in real life. Not true, beautiful people. People fantasize about a whole bunch of things. For example, if, I mean, a woman may want their partner to use a little physical force and threats, wanting her partner to coerce her into sexual activity against her will. It doesn't mean she actually wants to be raped. What it means is she wants her partner to take control, to control the situation, to control her pleasure. Sexual fantasies and role-playing let people experiment with out-of-character fantasies without the risk of guilt and harm. Some think that sharing sexual fantasies with your partner is dangerous and scary. Now, I don't know which prude came up with this. <coughs> Karen, <clears throat> but if you talk to many couples out there who have explored each other's sexual fantasies, they will tell you that sex is 100 times better. The number one tip is to talk about safety, rules, boundaries, safe words, letting your partner know when you're uncomfortable. How do you talk to your partner about sexual fantasies and role playing? The most wonderful thing about sex in general is that the person you are connected with gets to see you in a way that no one else will ever see you. It's a very intimate experience. First, you should figure out how to explain your reasons clearly for sharing your sexual fantasies. Second, make it the right time and place. Don't discuss this while you are cooking or doing chores. Get some alone time where it is only you with no distractions. Also, don't have the discussion in the bedroom. Even though you are talking about things in the bedroom, you don't want distractions. You both start talking about it and then you start fucking and it's kind of hard to go back to the discussion after you have come on your face or hair or ear. Uh, when exploring sexual fantasies, never mention someone you both know. There will be a fear of your partner acting on it. So that means keeping that hot coworker, brother-in-law or your friend's hot girlfriend off limits. Never share with anyone outside of the relationship. And yeah, that even means when you break up. 
If you have a partner who may be nervous or scared of the topic, it's important to let them know that you love them. Let them know you want to enjoy them in bed and that you want to spice it up a little. Ease into it. Don't go full crazy. And a great way to do this is by talking about sexy scenes in your favorite movies. Like the scene, the kiss in From Hell. Ladies know what I'm talking about. Listen without judgment. Your reaction should not be, uh, that's gross, pervert. There is no fucking way in hell I would let you stick it there. Just take a deep breath and keep in mind that the fantasy is just a fantasy. It doesn't mean that your partner wants to act it out in real life. Don't take it literal. Instead, explore the meaning of the fantasy together. If you don't like a certain sexual fantasy that can be harmful to a relationship, like a threesome, counter it with a part of a fantasy that will please you both. Instead of just refusing to take part in anything at all, both partners need to be willing to compromise. If you both can't get through that startup together properly, but really want to change, look for a sexologist or a sex therapist. Let's be done with the boring talk about role-playing tips and ideas. Yes, the fun part. It can be weird at first, but the more you do it, the easier it gets. There are three options of role-playing. Costuming, dress up like your favorite character, scenario. Act out a scenario like if you can prove that you're a model candidate, you probably get the job. Taboo, like a lonely, hot stepmother. Start off with the simple stuff. There is a board housewife and pool boy, doctor and patient, escort and client, boss and secretary, teacher and student, master and slave, study buddies, pilot and flight attendant, cheerleader and coach, farmer's daughter, cop and motorist, personal trainer and client, pizza delivery and lonely single, the eager applicant, yoga instructor, the naughty stripper, the chef and server, the rule-breaking masseuse, (laughs) happy ending, the lawyer, firefighter, and of course, the popular sexy maid. The next step after the vanilla step is to give these characters some characteristic, like the forceful teacher. What did I tell you about not doing your homework? Or the sweet nurse. You're such a big boy, Captain. I'm going to rub you down there. Just relax and tell me how that feels. Use your costume and outfit as part of the scenario, like a schoolgirl using the tie as a blindfold or the obvious handcuffs when a police officer. Role-playing is about being dynamic. Sex is about power. Play with a power role. Switch things around. You can begin outside of the bedroom like Reese Witherspoon and Vince Vaughn did in Four Christmases. Here are some other ideas that are beyond the basic if you want something a little different. There's the pirate and the wench photographer and model, caveman sex, cowboy and cowgirl, warden and prisoner, Disney prince and princess, hot hitchhiker, sexy singer and groupie, the apocalypse, fuck like it's the end of the world, Thor and Loki, literally all of us want that sex scene, Alice and the Mad Hatter, Doc Brown and Marty, Beetlejuice and Lydia, Mary Poppins and Bert, Joker and Harley, Woody and Bo Peep, Peter Pan and Tinkerbell, Spider-Man and Wonder Woman, or imagine fucking the mother of dragons. Listen, there are so many possibilities. Have fun with it. Don't be afraid to be crazy, awkward, or weird. You are exploring sexual fantasies with someone that you trust, so nothing can really go weird. That wraps up this segment. I hope you enjoyed the sex talk. I hope you try some of these out. I know I will. If you're interested in contacting me about voice work, send me an email, info at rachelreagan.com. Check me out on Casting Call. Tune in next time. Have a great month and get to fucking. The next song we're going to listen to is Romance by Taylor Kirk.
That was Romance. Gave me goosebumps and teary eyed the first time I heard it. Talented people I always get to talk to for this podcast, and I love it. If you want to hear more from Taylor, visit her website. The link is in the description. Entertainment News. What is up, everybody? I'm Aaron, and I'm very excited to start bringing you all the latest and greatest entertainment news of the past month. What I'm going to talk about today is just everybody's stuck at home, and it's really kind of shaking up what we're watching. You know, everybody's stuck at home, so a lot more things are being just released straight to streaming platforms. How does that affect their income? How does that affect sequels? So, you know, how does that affect all of that? And for starters, let's talk about what everybody is watching. The number one thing people have been watching, Trolls World Tour. And this makes a lot of sense. There's a lot of kids at home. There's a lot of families together watching things at home. And this definitely makes sense considering the success of the first Trolls movie. It is indeed a sequel to the 2016 original film. Trolls World Tour features a bunch of stars in the cast. Anna Kendrick, Justin Timberlake, Rachel Bloom, James Corden, Ron Bunches, Kelly Clarkson, Anderson Pock, Sam Rockwell, George Clinton, and Mary J. Blige all star in the film. It's a star-studded cast and it definitely makes sense why this movie is so popular. The next three spots on this list are Yellowstone Season 3, 2, and 1. It's pretty insane that they cover up three spots on this list. But a quick summary of Yellowstone, it follows the Dutton family, led by John Dutton, who controls the largest contentious ranch in the United States. The ranch is under constant attack by those who it borders, land developers, Indian reservations, and United States of America's first national park. It's an intense study of a violent world, far from media scrutiny, where land grabs developers billions, and politicians are bought and sold by the world's largest oil, natural gas, and lumber corporations, where unsolved murders are not news, they are a consequence of living in the new frontier. It is the best and worst of the United States, as seen through the eyes of a family that represents both. Yellowstone has an 8.4 out of 10 on IMDb and a 9.1 out of 10 on TV.com. You can watch it on Paramount Network's streaming app, and you can also purchase seasons one and two on Sling TV, Philo, YouTube TV, Fubo TV for the last bit of the first season, Amazon Prime Video for $1.99 per episode, and Vudu for $1.99 per episode, or $15 per season on both Prime Video and Vudu, as well as YouTube and Google Play Movies. Finally, foraying away from what people have been watching, Greyhound, which is currently at 80% on Rotten Tomatoes stars Tom Hanks, and it premiered on July 10th on Apple TV+. Plus. In this movie, Tom Hanks plays a captain or a commander of a naval ship, Greyhound, and it was pursued by German U-boats across the Atlantic Ocean along with 36 other allied ships. The director, Aaron Schneider, won an Oscar for Best Live Action Short Film back in 2003. So along with his abilities and Tom Hanks, this is set to be an outstanding film. So a film that I'm very excited for is Tenet by Christopher Nolan, or it's directed by Christopher Nolan. It stars John David Washington, who starred alongside Adam Driver in The Black Klansman in 2018. 
as well as Elizabeth Debicki, Aaron Taylor Johnson, Robert Pattinson, of course, of Twilight fame, Kenneth Branagh, Michael Caine, and Himesh Patel. And while not much is known about Tenet, we do know that it has something to do with John David Washington's spy character preventing World War III and an international espionage plot. It looks incredible. The trailer looks outstanding. I highly recommend you guys go check it out. Tenet is set to release on August 12th, 2020 to theaters. Very excited for that one. And on we go. Look, I know I said I was really excited for Tenet, but I'm also really excited for this one. We didn't get a chance to see it when it was set to release on May 8th, 2020. Personal History of David Copperfield. It stars Dev Patel of Lion fame, Peter Capaldi, Aaron Bernard, Ben Wishaw, Tilda Swinton, Hugh Laurie, Gwendolyn Christie, and Benedict Wong. It's a reimagining of that Charles Dickens novel told through a comedic lens by Armando Lenucci. And you might recognize that name from HBO's Veep. To close out the movies, I'm just going to talk about the final four that are set to release next month in August. Mulan, which is set on August 21st. It was originally supposed to premiere July 24th. That one's going to be a big one. Antebellum, which is set to release on August 21st, 2020. Bill and Ted Face the Music. That's going to be really exciting. The New Mutants, which is set on 28th of August, 2020. Now, touching up on the New Mutants, it doesn't look like even though Fox is now owned by Disney, that the New Mutants, although it is an X-Men film, is going to be a part of the MCU. Looks like it's completely separate from the MCU, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, that is. So there's something I want to do every monthly segment. I want to give you guys five shows to watch, whether they're on Netflix, Hulu, or some sort of other streaming platform. I want to recommend them, and you guys should go check them out. First off, I'm just going to clarify, Taika Waititi is probably my favorite director of all time. His ability to blend in serious topics and also make them funny is incredible for me, and he just speaks from his heart. I really connect with that. The first film I'm going to recommend is Jojo Rabbit. It gives a unique perspective on what what was going on during World War II as a child in World War II in Germany. It's kind of insane. You guys should go check it out. It's funny. It's also really deep and it's really heartwarming. Go check it out. It's a great film. Segwaying off of that, I should also recommend to you guys What We Do in the Shadows. It's also from Taika Waititi, but also Jermaine Clement. They make a wonderful team and it is a documentary, well, I should say mockumentary, which is just a comedic, satirical take on a documentary about vampires in New Zealand living in modern times. It follows Viago, Deacon, and Vladislav, who are finding that modern life as vampires is a little bit to deal with. The mundane, like paying rent, keeping up with the chore wheel, trying to get into nightclubs, and overcoming flatmate conflicts. It's a great film. Definitely go check that one out as well. What We Do in the Shadows was actually spawned off as a TV show on Hulu. I'd say you can watch the show without having seen the movie, but it's just adds on to the experience. You're going to get a little bit of references and some cameos if you watch the film first. You can, however, watch that show on Hulu for free with a subscription. They just finished out their second season, got renewed for a third season. A great, funny show. Definitely go check that one out. Trying to keep my recommendations this episode kind of simple, not anything unique or niche. So my final two recommendations would be for you guys to watch Futurama on Hulu, one of my all time favorite cartoons. And on Netflix, I would say check out Queer Eye, one of the most wholesome shows I've ever seen. It's great. It's really heartwarming. You might cry a little bit. You might not. I'm kind of a baby, so I cried a little bit on their fifth season right now. Go check it out. It's a great show. It'll make you smile, make you laugh and will most likely make you cry. And with that, I closed my first ever entertainment news segment. I'm very excited to be a part of this, and I'm really looking forward to being able to bring you guys a little more in-depth entertainment news for the whole month of July through August. I'm really looking forward to getting you guys better content, better news next month. Please have a wonderful day, stay safe, and remember, you're awesome. Hola! Are you a fan of Mexican food? Of course you are. Everybody is. Everybody loves a good taco or a good burrito or a good quesadilla. And you can get a pretty good one of these things in a lot of places, but where's the place with the best tacos, the best burritos, and the best quesadillas? It's at Taco Bobbles! That's right, Taco Bobbles is the king. El Rey de Burrito of Taco Quesadillas. But wait, wait, not only that, not only is Taco Bobbles the best for all traditional Mexican food, it is the only place, the one and the only place that serves the world famous Chupacabra! 
That's right, chupacabra. A massive Mexican meal of meat and cheese slathered in a red hot sauce. De chupacabra! Six kinds of queso and 11 kinds of meat. All of them good. Wrapped in four tortillas. And the sauce, the red sauce by itself, is worth climbing a border wall to get it. The chupacabra is a whopping five pounds of food in a two-handed delivery system. And the only place you can get the chupacabra is at Taco Babos. You got to Taco Babos to tell them the Pedro sent you. South of the border, Taco Babos. Find the chupacabra to come today. Taco Babos. Taco Babos is a wholly owned subsidiary of Flatusis Incorporated. Filling in again this month for the gaming segment. First news, PlayStation Hong Kong store fucked up by leaking Far Cry 6. It apparently posted the game way too early. I am one of those people that love the Far Cry series. I love every single one of them and look forward to playing the new one after each release. My favorite so far has been the fifth one before Far Cry 5. I've had always wanted them to do something in the States and to change it up from, you know, the island shit and they delivered. And the DLC was amazing. That's how you do a DLC. If you're getting a PS5 later this year, uh, you will be getting a free upgrade to the next version if you buy it on the PlayStation 4 first. The same has not been confirmed for the Xbox One yet, but we'll see because of the whole smart delivery feature shit. Tom Harlan showed off his new Nathan Drake look for the Uncharted movie. I am excited for this. I was late in playing the Uncharted series before the PS4 Pro. I had a PS2 and I hadn't played any games since then. But in 2018, I got a PS4 Pro and I was able to play the Uncharted series back to back. And after playing the, that series, I was like, they need to make a show or a movie. And I think Tom Harlan will be awesome as Nathan Drake. WWE 2K Battlegrounds trailer was released the other day and I just have to say what the fuck was that nope just nope nope no nope, nope. I read that Xbox is interested in taking over WB games it was funny to see PlayStation people complain like crazy but they don't they forget that many Xbox people missed out on the incredible Spider-Man game not me I had both but many people don't have both consoles so I love the idea because I have an Xbox game pass so I will be able to play the new releases so of course my bias says yes this is funny news. Nintendo fans were stunned at the upcoming eShop release, Don't Get Caught, a game centered around masturbation in public. Don't Get Caught is a silly and semi-scary first-person stealth game. You hitchhike and ride and then travel with the driver and a creepy doll. And during the ride, you have this crazy sensation to <laughs> masturbate. If you're looking for this game in the Nintendo eShop, don't bother. The game will no longer be released in the Nintendo eShop. Uh, I can't imagine people finding that, though. It makes me laugh thinking that somebody will find it and say, what the fuck is this? Or a parent, it'll be, I, I just think of that and I, I think it was hilarious. Xbox head Phil Spencer, who I think should be replaced, says that making games for both Xbox One and the next gen console won't hold back the Xbox Series X. Xbox gamers were starting to freak out because Sony is focusing entirely on the PS5 and making the exclusive games that are optimized to run on their latest and greatest console. Uh, Microsoft is telling the, its studios to ensure that all of their games remain compatible with the Xbox One, even as they make games for the Xbox Series X totally accurate uh, battle simulator is finally getting a release date it has been in early access for a while now the first time i saw this game was watching h2o delirious and cartoons play i have played it myself and it's very hilarious to play looking forward to the full game Sony is investing $250 million in Epic Games. I guess that's why we saw the Unreal Engine 5 tech demo running on the PS5. Um, the CEO of uh, Sony Corporation mentioned that Sony has produced a lot of entertainment outside of gaming. Epic's Unreal Engine has already been used for things like digital sets for The Mandalorian. Uh, Sony's investment in Epic will push for new technology and tools outside of the game that eventually will find a way uh, back to improve game development. Man. Fun stuff coming ahead. Amazon is making a Fallout TV show. They are working with the creators of Westworld. Many people are upset about this, but I am a Fallout fan. Always looking forward to the next one. Uh, I haven't played Fallout 76 because I wanted the game to be fixed. I heard it was shit. I'm glad I didn't pre-order it. I was broke at the time to pre-order it, and I'm glad I didn't because it's shit. I remember playing Fallout New Vegas and thought Fallout would be a great show, but we have to wait until the technology is badass. I think it's time because after watching Underwater with Kristen Stewart and saw their underwater suits, I was like, it's time. You check out their suits. As soon as I saw the suits, I instantly thought of Fallout. The Witcher on the Netflix was great. Now I'm looking forward to the Fallout TV show on Amazon and The Last of Us on HBO. Speaking of The Last of Us, let's talk about Last of Us 2. 
now that it has been released and we have played it now i can give you my take because of uh, what i said last time spoiler warning i liked it it looked amazing it looked like it was supposed to be a ps5 game absolutely gorgeous i was excited to return into that world and i have fun i could see why people were so upset with joel being killed right off the bat but i understand that naughty dog was going for the shock in your face now i didn't mind killing him off but i just wish that they just told it just a little bit better give me a reason to like abby give me a reason to care about these people that did that i give it a 7 out of 10. now what upsets me is the community and the company punishing individuals that doesn't give the game a 10 out of 10. the critics have been giving this game 10 out of 10. gamers have been giving it a very low score the director said that people were going to be split and they still made it anyways but what these critics and other idiots failed to realize that people are upset at how the story was told i went to the game not watching and listening to reviewers and critics i loved the first game and was ready to play it like i said i would have killed joe at the end i would have done the same thing and i would have wanted the players to warm up to abby in the game then after i played it is when i went online and watched people's reviews and i couldn't believe the chaos the thing that upsets me is that people that gave it the same rating as me are being called transphobic or bigoted according to these 10 by 10 mindless robots if you don't give a game a hundred or a 10 out of 10 you're transphobic or bigoted when you read most of these people's reasoning they are all saying the same thing i said that the game looks great the gameplay is great abby who killed joe is a trans and it didn't bother me one bit i actually like playing abby she was more badass than playing ellie i don't know i like playing abby she kicked ass but like i said i wish i got to know abby and everybody else just a little bit better and i just didn't care for them i do like where they were trying to go i do like the shock value i love how naughty dog went there but instead of defending their choices everything is now you're either transphobic or sellout it's like i told you last month about the snyder cut when you give people power like this they will get nasty i'm still gonna be playing the last of us 3 and all the dlc that comes with 2 i liked it deal with it the last thing i want to talk about is loot boxes i am a hundred percent against loot boxes and any form of microtransactions that take advantage of people in the worst possible way there was this article from the bbc news that caught my attention there was a young guy who blew his university savings on fifa i want to read you the entire article by felicity hannah and jane andrew here it goes like many teenagers, Jonathan enjoyed buying random player packs to build up his team on the FIFA football video game. But when his mother was diagnosed with cancer, his spending on these packs or loot boxes became, as he sees it, an addiction he couldn't control. The House of Lords Gambling Committee is calling for loot boxes, which are not currently considered to be gambling, to be regulated urgently. I have followed video games since I was a child. I remember waking up early on the weekends and heading straight downstairs to play FIFA 05 with the sound off so that I wouldn't wake my parents, says Jonathan. Now, 21, I am fortunate to have made some of my closest friends online, and I think that video games can be a great for any child. I stress this before saying that I feel compelled to tell my story of how loot box gambling led to one of the worst experiences of my life. In 2009, EA Sports launched the Ultimate Team Game Mode in their FIFA series. It's like a huge online football trading card game, and users can then add these players to their teams. Better players gives you an advantage, and there is a virtual currency and market where these cards are traded. You can buy packs containing a random selection of cards. I distinctly remember back in 2012 when I first asked my parents if I could use my money to buy packs, and my frustration when my dad said the packs were gambling before finally agreeing, and it was frustrating. The idea that it was gambling seemed ridiculous to me at the time. I understood that the chances of unpacking my favorite players were low. I spent the money, opened my packs, got lucky a couple of times, and tried to be positive, despite being left feeling slightly underwhelmed. If I could just spend another 15 pounds, I thought. Four years followed of spending more and more on player packs, each time seeking that buzz that would only occasionally come. As time went on, I was becoming increasingly secretive about it. I would buy a voucher from a high street shop and hide it in my room so my parents wouldn't find out how much I was spending. At that time, I had nothing else I would rather spend my money on. I thought each time that this time would be one where I got lucky. 
When I was 17, I got my first debit card and suddenly the decision to spend money on the game became instant. Just a click of a button away with no need to buy the vouchers and worry that my parents would find them. 2017 was the year that changed everything in my life. I was completing my last year of A-levels with vague plans to go to university. In September, my mom was diagnosed with cancer. Everything became about waiting until it would all just be a memory. Waiting until the day that my mom's treatment would be over. When I had finished my exams and we could all appreciate normal life again, I searched for any way to cope. The buzz of opening packs offered me an escape. Any rational sense of moderation and the value of money that my parents and grandparents had saved for my future began to subside. I felt like I needed the money now to cope and that in years to come, my future self would somehow understand. I was spending 30 pounds at a time, then 40 pounds, then 50 pounds. By that time, my car began to block my transaction. I was throwing 80 pounds into the game four or five times a night. A few weeks before my exams, after days of watching people open packs on YouTube, while as my parent thought I was upstairs revising, the moment came when the money ran out. Money that my parents and grandparents had worked for, that had been given to me as savings for my future. I had blown almost 3,000 pounds. I accept responsibilities for what happened. The decisions I made to spend that money were made by me. My parents were heartbroken when they found out and read through the bank statements. Looking back at what happened, one of the things that sticks out to me is how my spending was going on without my family knowing. We had family rules with restrictions on gaming time, so there was no lack of parental regulation. And I frequently told my concerned parents that I was not addicted to video games themselves. I stand by that now, but I was addicted to the buzz of chance when I bought packs. I agree now with what my dad said that so angered me back in 2012. Video game packs and loot boxes are a form of gambling. With the House of Lords Gambling Committee calling for randomized reward purchases like these to be urgently regulated under gambling laws, I want to do what I can to educate and protect other people from going through an experience like mine. I owe it to my teenage self and to others who would regret spending money on loot boxes to do what I can to end what is utter exploitation. The makers of FIFA, EA Sports, deny any aspect of FIFA constitutes gambling and agree with the assessment made by the Gambling Commission that loot boxes are not gambling. They say FIFA Ultimate Team can be played without spending any money and that purchases are entirely optional. They go on to say the well-being of players is paramount and all their games, including FIFA, have the ability to use parental controls provided by gaming platforms to cap or prohibit spending. FIFA was approached for comment, but has not yet responded. That's the end of the article. Before I say what I have to say about loot boxes and shitty microtransactions, check out what EA thinks of loot boxes. They think it's ethical. Do you consider loot boxes to be a, an, an ethical feature of your games. Kerry? Well, first, we don't call them loot boxes. I think that was... Whatever a, term but, you but, wish to apply yeah, to them, so, do so, you consider them ethical? So what we look at as, as surprise mechanics. <laughs> um, but I think it's important to look at this. So uh, if, if, you go to, if you go to a... Uh, I don't know what your version of Target is, but as a store that sells a lot of toys and you do a search for surprise toys, what you'll find is that this is something people enjoy. They enjoy surprises. And so it's, it's something that's been part of toys for years, whether it's Kinder Eggs or Hatchimals or LOL Surprise. Um, we do think the way that we have implemented these kind of mechanics, and, and FIFA, of course, is our big one, our FIFA Ultimate Team and our packs is actually quite ethical and quite fun, enjoyable to people. Um, we agree with the UK Gambling Commission, the Australian Gambling Commission, and many other gambling commissions that they aren't gambling. And we also disagree that there's evidence that shows it leads to gambling. Instead, we think it's like many other products that people enjoy in a very healthy way uh, and like the element of surprise. Okay, so just to be absolutely clear, <laughs> your loot boxes or surprise mechanics you have no ethical qualms whatsoever. Uh, so I, I think you're recharacterizing my language. What I said is I think the way we've implemented our FIFA Ultimate Team packs is ethical. Okay, other than FIFA and, and other games that you provide, 
do you have, are you, are you equally comfortable and relaxed about For all of the games we have on the market that have a randomized content mechanic, a surprise mechanic, a loot box, um, I, I have no qualms that they are implemented in an unethical way. Fucking surprise mechanics. This is what the chair of the House of Gambling Committee had to say about loot boxes over there in the UK. Most people who gamble enjoy it safely. However, gambling-related harm has made the lives of 2 million people miserable. It leads to hundreds of people each year taking their own lives leaving family and friends devastated. The behavior of some gaming operators where vulnerable people were targeted with inducements to continue gambling when the operators knew they could not afford to shocked the committee. Urgent action by the government is required. Lax regulation of the gambling industry must be replaced by a more robust and focused regime which prioritize the welfare of gamblers ahead of the industry profits. That's what they said. The Lord say that the loot boxes should be classified as games of chance, which would bring them under the Gambling Act of 2005. They also have said that if a product looks like gambling and feels like gambling, it should be regulated as gambling. Listen, so loot boxes has been controversial in games for a while now. They offer players a chance at randomized reward when open. The boxes can often be bought for real money and the rewards can sometimes be traded. Now, many people, especially non-gamers, will look at this guy and be like, he's a fucking idiot. He should have known better. What you don't understand is that these loot boxes are designed to exploit certain people that have the need to spend because of that dopamine, the chemical in your fucking brain that makes you want to do this shit, that, that, that gets you addicted when they make it colorful and fun with fucking confetti and certain sound effects. What pisses me off is not grown fuckers that purchase these things. It is the way companies like EA are targeting the young kids. If you are a parent, you actually have to take a step beyond setting up a parental control. In the UK, the government is fighting the fight, but the rest of the world, these companies are still making billions of dollars every year. And in these are in games that are labeled E for everyone. They are in E plus 10 games, meaning anyone 10 years or older can play it. And they're also in T for teens. No warning, no nothing. So if you are a parent who just look at the rating and think you did a good job, you have to pay attention because no matter what, your kid will find a way to use these loot boxes or microtransactions. I have a family member where the little dude spends every money he gets for microtransactions because of the addiction. It's not right the way these companies go after kids. This is how they make their money. Players get that rush with the possibility of getting something cool. When you don't get what you want, you get a little disappointed. But the one time you do get it, it feels great. Don't fall for that shit. And if you have kids, don't let them fall for that shit. I don't give a fuck if an adult man spends their fucking money on Madden games doing that stupid shit. I don't give a fuck if an adult woman spends her fucking money on cooking madness when she's playing it on the iPad. What I mind is when all these fucking companies target kids. Take Fortnite, for example. You got the llama piñatas. You buy it, and a fucking digital candy pops out with stupid shit. Oh, but Steven, kids don't have to buy these things. Well, guess what? I have a young family member who spends all his damn money on these fucking games. Birthday money, Christmas money, allowance. Nine years old. And also explain this, if you think that they're not targeting kids, why the fuck is that same llama in the toy section at Target? Not in the gaming section, not in the men's section, not in the women's section, it's in the toy section next to Buzz Lightyear and Pokemon toys. And you know what's inside that stupid fucking piñata? You got stickers and tattoo and real fucking confetti and the candy. That's it. What y'all need to do is speak up about this shit. Don't let these fuckers win and get your representative involved. Get the government involved. Share the story or other people's story that went through this. Talk about it to people. Do what you have to. Just say no to loot boxes. Just as I'm recording this, I had to take a break before moving on to record the fun topic. On my break, I saw this funny video of Angry Joe flipping out over a dumb microtransaction from Valorant. This is the shit I'm talking about. Fucking loot boxes and greedy microtransactions. It had me laughing so hard. So I'm going to play the clip as the last thing for the gaming news. And you got it. And that's from the, that was the first one that you put. And it's the second one. It's a fucking bunny. You're doing this on purpose to me. You're trying to kill me, Valorant. Don't you fucking buy this shit. Don't none of you buy this shit. I swear to God, Valorant, you have literally the worst 
fucking payment model the worst fucking skins the worst fucking ideas how can you possibly ask gamers to spend nearly a hundred fucking dollars on a digital worthless good that does fucking nothing it's a little oozy little fucking dragon you know what make your game fucking cool is if you made your guns are you, are you out of your mind look like that or made them with challenges where you have to actually unlock them with fucking skill are you, are you out of your mind so everybody knows oh that's the guy that kills everybody oh that's the guy he's really good he's a legend amongst us gamers no but now it's oh that's the guy that's got a bunch of fucking money and he loves burning it and throwing it in the goddamn fire of this gump dumpster garbage trash fire of a year 2020 and valorant is making it even worse with their stupid ass bullshit don't buy fucking shit from valorant don't or we cannot be friends the last song we're going to hear is bellevue Welcome by machine That was Machine's most recent song. You've heard them before. You heard Turn and Walk Away in episode three. If you want to hear more from Machine and see what they're up to, click on the link in the description.
For the fun topic, I wanted to talk about the changes to certain Disney rides. If you haven't heard, but Disney is looking to replace the Splash Mountain theme with Princess and the Frog. This idea was due to what's been going on. This is Disney's way of saying, hey, don't look at us. We're not racist. This is what I think of it. I agree with the change, not because of the reasons why they are doing it, but it was time. After having an incredible Disney dining experience at Tiana's on the Disney Wonder, I was like, this feeling I got after dinner needs to be in the parks with the whole Princess and the Frog theme. I love the music. I loved everything about it. And I started thinking, what rides that it can replace? It needs a ride. And the first one I thought was Splash Mountain. My boys don't care about the song of the South. They like the zippity doo song at the end, but nothing about the theme when they're going through this shit. It's, they don't care. It's not memorable. Disney needed to replace many rides with their IPs, and that's what they're doing now. And for those of you who don't know what IPs mean, it means intellectual property, the shit that they own. Anyways, The Princess and the Frog is one of my favorite movies. Love the music and love the story. The only thing that I didn't like is that we finally got a black princess and she ended up being a fucking frog the whole time. Whatever. Watch the Splash Mountain ride. Like, go on YouTube and watch the Splash Mountain ride from the Orlando or the Disneyland. And, and you'll see that there's this long part, really, really long with all the animatronics and shit. And you'll see it's a little bit boring. But that long part, you know, when you're going through the forest, it would be an awesome opportunity for the song that they'll be playing that, uh, that going down to Bayou while you're going through there. Disney can do some amazing effects, especially after seeing Mickey Runaway Railway. Imagine the fireflies doing some awesome things like they did in the movie, you know, leading you to the path while you're hearing that song. And then at the end of the Splash Mountain ride, instead of hearing zippity doo dah, you can hear uh, Dig a Little Deeper. Splash Mountain can be a musical, jazzy experience way better. Better than what Splash Mountain is today. People can go walk out of there and still having certain songs in your head, not what it is right now. Right now, you're like, ha, that was fine. We got wet. You get wet. That's it. That is not the only idea I had, you know, before Disney, just like this, thought of the same. So here's my ideas of other Disney rides and experiences that Disney should change, both in Orlando, Florida, and Anaheim, California. Let's start with the Magic Kingdom. Now, many rides I will mention is also in Disneyland. You know, they're almost identical, so it can apply there, too. So I won't be mentioning uh, Disneyland. First one is a treehouse in Adventureland. People don't really care for the Swiss Family Treehouse and the Jungle Cruise. It's fucking boring. People like them. You know, old people like them. And kids like climbing the shit and little kids like going to Jungle Cruise. But I don't care if The Rock and Emily Blunt is doing a Jungle Cruise movie. I think it's a waste of space. I don't care how old this shit is. I don't. It's boring. But right in front of the Jungle Cruise is an Aladdin ride, a little carpet thing that's like Dumbo. Imagine turning the whole Jungle Cruise area. And, and you can't tell me it's like, oh, people like being on the boats and, and people like being in the water and having fun. It's a great experience. You know, people said the same shit about Jaws. I like Jaws. But then they took that shit out in Orlando. And I mean, in Hollywood, you could still see it in part of the, the tour. But, you know, in Orlando, they had it way bigger. And I'm happy with what they replaced. They replaced it with Diagon Alley. Way better than one fucking ride. So here's my idea. Imagine turning that whole Jungle Cruise section into Agrabah. Create a thrill ride that makes you feel like you're riding on a magic carpet. You can have a show somewhere there with a genie who interacts with, with you know, the audience. And it, it, every time I... From here in the rest of the segment, if I mention like a, a land or stuff, just imagine, you know, shops and, and restaurants and that shit, too. OK, because you know, you'll hear me just talk about just the rides. But, you know, just it, it, it's common sense that there will be shops and foods and, and all that stuff. OK, for years, I felt like Aladdin was always left out. I've only seen Jafar during a Halloween event, a Ginny in the parade, Jasmine here and there when princes are involved. And for some fucking reason, I've only seen Aladdin at Epcot. Uh, let's move on to Tom Sawyer Island, another big waste of space. The, another reason, you know, they keep it there because, you know, it's been there from the beginning. I think it's a waste of space. I think that Disney should create a new IP that takes place in the Wild West with another thrill ride that is similar to what Knott's Berry Farm has. Go online and check out Knott's Berry Farm's Pony Express. Very fun ride. Something like that is way better than a ferry ride in Tom Sawyer fucking island. The Speedway should be rethemed for kids. Yes, adults ride it, but the majority of the people that ride it are kids with their parents. My boys love the, the chance to drive something, and, and they love it. You ride it over and over. And most young kids, 
who watches Disney Junior love Mickey and the Roaster Racers. So I think kids will love that ride even more if it was themed to that. Another ride that needs to change and just only the ending so that they don't get rid of the whole thing is they need to update Disney's Carousel of Progress. It was one of my favorites growing up, but now we are living in that future. Everything that, that I've seen in that future, we're, we're living it right now. So they need to change it to make it, you know, fucking 20 years, 30 years ahead. Think of out of the box, something Walt Disney would do. The people mover, as my family called it, the lazy ride, should be redone or taken out. Many people will get upset, but I'm sure it cost Disney a lot of money to keep that shit going. The only good part is going through Space Mountain. That's the only part that we all get excited for. It's like, oh, here's we get to go inside it. We get to see it. And sometimes if you're lucky, which it happened to me, the lights are on in Space Mountain. You're like, oh, shit, real quick. You get to see it. Speaking of Space Mountain, it needs a new theme. You got to admit, no matter how fun it is when you're actually riding it, it's a little bit boring on the way there. I mean, when you go to the Halloween event, they usually change it, but they still need to change the whole theming, you know, when it's not Halloween. And here's my idea. I'm thinking Wally. Think how cool it would be to see Wally throughout the ride. And you make that whole thing, that whole area seem like you're on that ship from that movie. Because right now it's just dark and boring. And when you're standing in line for a fucking while, it's just boring. Uh, another thing that they need to change in Magic Kingdom, uh, this ride is also in DCA, Filler Magic. Filler Magic is one of my favorites. But if they want lines again, because every time I go, even in the busiest times, it's like a 10 minute, 15 minute wait. That's it. Not many people are doing it. And I love it. And I feel like it's they're going to be taking it away. But they need to update the songs. Take me to Princess and the Frog. Take me through Tangled and Frozen. There's a lot of new songs since that show debuted. A lot of new songs that we most of the little kids would prefer. Let's move on to Epcot. Epcot is going through some big changes. And after seeing their plans last year at D23, I'm excited. But there are two that I wish they changed. First is the test track. Over here in DCA, you can ride the Radiator Springs Racers that takes the same model of the test track and put it in the world of cars. Awesome ride. After you ride that and then you ride the test track, you are going to be disappointed. They did change it from when I first rode the test track. Now it's all futuristic looking and shit. At least the old one had a little fun crash test thing before, you know, you zoom outside. It, it made it seem like you were about to crash the wall, but then the walls open. But I think they should redesign it to the car steam as well. But instead of making Radiator Springs, like in DCA, make it the Rusty's Racing Center. Look at the building in Epcot of the test track and look at the Rusty's building in Cars 3. Disney can easily make that Rusty's building. This way, Disney can showcase all the new characters like Cruise. And the test track that you go out and open, close it up. Close it up and make it Thunder Hollow. So it feels like you're racing with Miss Fritter and the gang. The other ride I would change is the Grand Fiesta Tour starring the three Caballeros. As great as that ride is and how awesome it is to see the, the three Caballeros, what would be even greater is Coco. I love the Coco movie, theming and music. When you walk into the Mexican pavilion, it looks like you're outside once you're inside beautiful. Imagine eating and shopping with the cocoa theme. It would be beautiful. Let's move on to Hollywood Studios. There's a lot of land between Toy Story Land and Sunset Boulevard. I would remove the Star Wars launch base since it's far from Galaxy's Edge anyways and make it the entry to a new area. I would theme this area as Onward's Fantasy World. Pixar got its inspiration from iconic properties like Lord of the Rings and Dungeons and Dragons. Just think about that setting in Disney with those types of things. All the stores and shit like that. It would be awesome. Watch the movie on Disney Plus and pay attention to the world. Imagine the main ride featuring Ian and Barley, uh, meaning Tom Harlan and Chris Pratt voicing the ride. Another area I would create would be between the Onward Land and Sunset Boulevard. The entrance would be between Sunset Ranch Market and Rock and Roller Coaster. The land I'm thinking of is Monsters, Inc. I would also change the Rock and Roller Coaster to Monsters, Inc. Roller Coaster Ride. If you haven't been on the Rock and Roller Coaster Ride, check it out on YouTube. Imagine changing that part you see Aerosmith in the sound booth to a Monsters, Inc. characters. You can make it as the screen floor or you could do it after the movie where it's the laughing floor. Instead of riding through all the street shit, you could ride through the doors that you see in the Monsters, Inc. At the end, when you see all those fucking doors, it would be awesome and way more fun than Aerosmith sing screaming in your ear. One more ride I would add would be an Incredibles ride. They have the Incredicoaster in DCA, but doing something similar to what they are doing with the Spider-Man ride at DCA would be great at Hollywood Studios. Imagine helping Mr. Incredible and his family and all the other characters, uh, you helping them fight like you're going to help Spider-Man fight in Avengers Campus. The entrance would be right through Munisiburg. 
Let's move on to Animal Kingdom. I would add three lands there. The first idea that I have is Zootopia. The land can fit between Africa and Pandora. The theme just fits there. That's all I have to say about that. Between Africa and Asia, I would do Wakanda and have a Black Panther ride. In Asia, I would remove the raft ride. I've ridden many raft rides in my lifetime, and this raft ride is boring. Looks nice. It's sort of refreshing after a hot day, but it is always packed because people want to get wet. And when you finally ride the ride after waiting a long time, you will feel it wasn't really worth the wait, especially if you barely got wet. The best raft ride that you will get wet and is long and has many drops is the one in DCA. Uh, for the Asia to replace it, I would add a new IP, like I said with Tom Sawyer. I think Disney needs to make their own version of Kung Fu Panda and then make that whole area the theme and have a ride. The only good ride in Asia is Everest, but it's all the way in the corner of Asia. That raft ride takes up so much space. So let's go to DCA, Disney's California Adventure over here in Anaheim. I feel like it is the smallest of the parks. Well, maybe it's the same size as Hollywood Studios, and it happens to be my personal favorite. A Pixar Pier is amazing. Carland is amazing. And I'm looking forward to the Avengers Campus that will be replacing Bugs Land. They just don't have enough casual dining places. It's the only problem that I have with DCA. I would change two things. The first being the Monsters, Inc. ride. It's boring. Yes, kids love it, and it's a great ride if you have tiny ones since they could sit on your lap, but it's boring. It's a big waste of space. Even when it's busy, the longest wait time is 15 minutes. I think they just replace the whole section with San Francisco from the Big Hero 6 and have obviously a ride featuring the Big Hero 6 characters. It would be fun. Another idea that would be a good replacement is an up ride. Build something like the Spider-Man ride in Islands of Adventure, Universal, in Orlando, you know, where it makes it feel like you're flying. Before I move on to the water parks and hotels, I have to say, I think that the restaurants on all of the Disney properties should be themed and the experience should be great. Let me explain. Yes, there's a lot of character breakfast and it's good and it's great if you like taking pictures with the characters. But once you experience Rapunzel's Royal Table on the Disney Magic or Tiana's Place on the Disney Wonder or Animator's Palette on any of their ships, you definitely want to experience that in a, in a restaurant in the Disney Park. It is absolutely wonderful and it's an unforgettable experience. You can see my videos of it at Subscribe Store or look up other people experiencing it on YouTube. You will be amazed at what they do if you haven't experienced that yet. In all of their parks, there are wasted opportunities. All the restaurants, they never give you that wow factor. They may look awesome. It may look cool and beautiful. Like when you have breakfast at the Be Our Guest restaurant in Magic Kingdom, which is beautiful. But that's it. You don't get anything past what you experience on the cruises. At Disney Springs and Orlando and downtown Disney and Anaheim, they're great spots to do some themed restaurants. All we got was a Rainforest Cafe, which there's not even a Rainforest Cafe in, in Anaheim anymore. But in Orlando, you still got the Rainforest Cafe and T-Rex. You know, those are the themed um, restaurants. That's it. That's all you got. Like, to me, why haven't they made a full-blown pizza planet yet? They sort of did in Disneyland to replace the pizza thing that's next to Space Mountain. But come on, it's shit. I would have preferred in Orlando a badass, full-blown pizza planet than a fucking NBA experience that replaced Disney Quest, which was one of my favorite experiences. Not many people liked it, but it was my personal favorite. Anyways, let's go to Typhoon Lagoon. The only thing I love about this water park is a wave pool. I have been to so many water parks across the states, and Typhoon Lagoon has the best wave pool around. Bigger waves, it's just incredible. I mean, people surf early in the morning. I could spend hours resting on the waves. Absolutely amazing. I just think that they need to retheme the whole park. I think they should do a Lilo and Stitch or compete with Universal's uh, Volcano Bay and do Moana since Volcano Bay has a kind of an islandy theme. It just needs a change. I love Stitch. He's my second favorite Disney character. So, of course, I pick Lilo and Stitch theme. Let's go to Blizzard Beach. It needs a theme. The best choice, and as soon as I say it, y'all will be like, why the hell hasn't Disney done it already? Ready? Olaf's Beach. It's fucking perfect. If you don't know what Blizzard Beach is, it is a wintry themed water park in Central Florida. Olaf loving summer and is a snowman? I mean, come on. That tall drop ride can be Elsa's tower. Changing the whole thing to frozen theme setting in Florida would be amazing. I don't know why they haven't done it yet. Let's go on to hotels. There's a lot of retheming that Disney has to do with their resorts. Another thing that I don't understand why Disney haven't gotten it yet. I get not going crazy with the expensive ones like the Grand Californian or the Riviera because the rich folks don't really like anything too crazy. But there are some resorts that I think can do with some nice retheming. 
In California, I think the hotels are perfect. I just wish that there was a quicker entrance to the parks from the Paradise Pier Hotel than to having to walk past Disneyland Hotel and walk from the end of downtown Disney all the way to the park entrance. You could see the Incredicoaster from the hotel lobby or the parking lot, but you have to walk all the way around to get in. It needs some type of bridge, some type of underground entrance or something. In Orlando, there are resorts that need help. Disney music needs help. It is out of date and fucking boring, especially if you stay in the Broadway area in the far back past the main pool, past all that. It's boring back there. Looks out of date. Nothing around there feels like Disney. Many people say that the sports need an update. I just think they just need to make things a little bit more fresh. But I will give you guys a tip. Never book there. Orlando brings a lot of sports conferences and games with schools from all over the Southeast. The sports resort is the first place they book. And it gets busy as fuck with these groups. Those kids, you know, they don't give a fuck. They're on a kind of like a work vacation. And their group takes up the bus seats when they're going to the park. They take up tables at the food court. They take up chairs at the pool. It drives me fucking nuts because they take whole big sections. And also stay away from pop and movies. Many people go there first to save money. If you're trying to save money and you want to go to a value Disney resort, just go to the music. It's boring, like I said, but it won't be as packed. And the movies and the pop resort can use an update to compete with the animation resort. Because you go to the animation resort and then you go to those other value resorts and it's just night and day. One is beautiful and colorful and the other one's like, well, there goes 101 Dalmatians. Like, it's just, that's it. They need to update with movies and things of today that kids will recognize. And uh, let's move on to the moderate resorts. The Caribbean Beach Resort is my favorite one to stay at. I feel like you get your money's worth, especially when you account for the transportation to the parks. The two Port Orleans are the good choices too. The Riverside is a little quieter, would be my pick if you had to choose one or the other. But I think... A Princess and a Frog theme would be great for both. Go crazy at the French Quarter, you know, with the Mardi Gras and shit, and have Tiana's Place on the riverside. Coronado Springs would be great with the Kogo theme. Cabins in Disney Fort Wilderness needs a massive update. It looks exactly the same as it did when I went there in the mid-90s. Right now, it's not worth the price. You get a cabin, everything feels out of date. But that doesn't mean that Fort Wilderness is not a good place to stay at if you have an RV or a camper or you love just camping with a tent. It's a perfect place to go there and do what I've done. I've been in the cabin, but I've also been camping with tents. You could drive there with your camping gear. And if you're flying in, you can actually rent their tents and stuff and they'll have it ready for you. It is an awesome experience. So if you love sleeping outdoors and don't mind the Florida heat, you should give it a try. You still have access to all of the park transportation and the Magic Express to the airport, as well as the amenities and events like the movie nights around the campfire with the Chippendale. It's just an awesome experience. Let's move on to the deluxe resort. The only ones that I don't remember much about is the uh, Yacht Club and the Beach Club. The boardwalk in is awesome because of the shops and restaurants and the boardwalk. Ice cream place is really good. The Contemporary Resort is convenient to the Magic Kingdom and it has some amazing theme park views. It's, uh, Chef Mickey is there and it's a lot of fun. The Wilderness Lodge is absolutely stunning, especially the pool area. Polynesian Village is also beautiful and they have great restaurants. The same can be said for the Animal Kingdom Lodge. Really good restaurants too, especially for breakfast. Uh, the Grand Floridian Resort is shit. The Grand Floridian Resort is shit. Never stay there. It's overpriced for what they give you. The amenities are good, but the rooms are nothing special. I like going there in Christmas just to walk through the lobby to see the gingerbread house. But they need to change something. They need, they, I don't know. I mean, it's one of the best spots. It's just, if you're going to spend that kind of money, pick the Wilderness Lodge. The Disney Riviera is new and I haven't been, so I can't say much about it. I haven't stayed at the Disney Villas because, well, it is far beyond my price range. And I mean, the deluxe resorts are expensive too, but some nights in non-peak seasons, I like to spend one night just to experience it. Keep in mind that all of the resort restaurants and stores can be visited, even if you don't stay there. I do it all the time. Here in California, I like to go to Tangaroa Terrace Restaurant for a drink and nachos. My wife loves the coffee there, and the boys love their hot chocolate, and it has an inviting Hawaiian theme. You certain nights you can hear some amazing Hawaiian music. Great atmosphere. Keep in mind you could get your parking ticket validated so that you don't have to pay nothing to a portion of the full price at any of the resorts. As long as you eat and purchase um, certain things on the, on the resort. 
I think that Disney's Castaway K Island that you get to go when you're cruising on the East Coast should have a Pirates of the Caribbean theme. The only thing that you get when you get there is characters in bathing suits or beach outfits. That's it. Speaking of Disney cruises, I think they need to give you the same experience as they did with the Tiana's, Rapunzel's, and Animator's Palette. When you are cruising with the Disney, you have rotational dining. But every ship has restaurants that didn't go as big as the ones I mentioned. For example... Triton's, which is the Little Mermaid theme, has a little more formal theme to it. And I remember sitting there and looking around and they had a beautiful mural and you could see Sebastian in the decor on the wall, but that's it. I think they should have had a mechanical Sebastian or something with his orchestra to give you some music while you eat. It would have been beautiful if they wanted to keep that whole formal looking thing. It's just a wasted opportunity. It's the same thing that could be said in the other ones when you have the Prince's restaurant and stuff. Nothing is wow. Before I wrap up the fun topic and finish this episode, I think that Disney needs to let people feel the Disney magic when they're on their property. And I'm not talking about their parks or stores and restaurants. I am talking about when you arrive, when you are walking around, you don't really get any of the magic until you are in the park. You see the sign, pictures, paintings, and billboards, but that's it. You just told people that they entered Disney World, but you don't get any of the Disney magic until you are in the parks. I think that you should give visitors the magic for free while they're are on the property. The only thing you might see is a character walking by, but they won't stop for you. They just wave and keep on walking. What do I mean by more Disney magic? Well, here's an example. You can make the Contemporary Resort an Avengers headquarters. Besides meeting the Avengers there, imagine at night looking towards the Contemporary Resort and you see the Avengers fighting on the rooftop for five minutes every night, not using real people, but using projection technology that they have used in many of the rides. It can be so cool to see. Think about it. Thor's lightning, Spider-Man swinging around. Just think of a kid pointing, saying, look, look, I can see Captain America on the roof. I mean, they're doing, they're starting to do a little bit of that now, like in DCA, you you're going to be able to walk in the Avengers campus and they have like a robotic Spider-Man that's just going to swing right above you. And that's it. I think that's going to be awesome. Uh, another idea you can have there in Disney World is, you know, building the house and balloons from up. Nobody can go to it. Nobody can ride it. It just rises from somewhere in the Florida swamp. And for a few times every day, the house and the fake balloons goes up, stays up for a little bit, and then goes right back down. Up close, there's nothing to it. You can't see it. It's hidden. Maybe something like a hot air balloon or something. And visitors, like I said, won't be able to find it when they're trying to drive around and look for it. They won't be able to. They don't know where it came from. I mean, they know the area because, you know, you use common sense, but you can't get to it. Imagine a view from the resort to a visitor. This is an awesome Easter egg, you know, worth looking out for when you're like, oh, look at the up house just floating up there. That's the type of magic I'm talking about. That's what they should do. There's so many things that Disney can do in all of their Disney properties across the world to make people feel the magic before they get into the park. And I just feel like people, especially kids, should feel that magic right away. I feel like they shouldn't have to wait until they get into the park to feel a certain magic or a ride. Sometimes sometimes you get in the park right away, you don't get that magic. You get it when you're riding a ride, like the newest Star Wars ride. As you can see, I'm a huge Disney fan. Growing up, we used to live about two and a half hours south of Orlando, and many people were able to fly here, fly there, vacation here, vacation there, and it was just cheaper for us to go to Orlando, stay at a decent hotel on International Drive or somewhere else in Kissimmee, and stick to a reasonable food budget. As a kid, I didn't care. Me and my siblings didn't care if we had McDonald's at the hotel. We didn't care. All we cared is that we were in Orlando, going to Disney, Universal, SeaWorld. That's that's all we cared. It was always a quick trip. We went there in one night, went to the park the next night, and the third day we came back. It was always quick. It was cheaper to do that. So I was very blessed and fortunate to be able to go to to Orlando. So I've been to these parks so many times and living here in California, me and my wife take the kids all the time here and I missed Orlando and Orlando is way better. In my personal opinion, Orlando is way better. Uh, you get a better Disney experience here. It's great for visiting D23. It's great for DCA because you'll get some of these rides like Cars Land is nowhere in Orlando. So you get that experience and Avenger Camp is soon will be the only one here. Anyways, if you're like me, let me know and we can share stories and and talk Disney. I'm always for it. Okay. So let's wrap up this episode. If you really like Out of Place, I mean, really like it, can't wait for the next episode like it, I need your help. You know, I'm all about triggering mindless robots. They are now starting to rate the podcast with one star. Don't let them win. Go to iTunes and give it a rating. 
takes only a couple of seconds. And if you give this podcast a review on there or any platform you're listening to this on, you can share it with me and you will be able to get to choose what I talk about in the next touchy or fun topic. The next thing I want to talk about is Subscribestar, the whole $1 a month thing that I keep talking about. I decided that I wanted to do something different. Yes, it would be nice to use the money for the show and for selfish reasons, better minds and blah, 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 blah. But I decided how cool it would be to do what many of us has done at school or at work. You know, when you have a potluck or something, you pay, you know, something for the food and you and it gets added to the end of the year Christmas party or when you were in high school and all of the money from the dumb events all year long went to the senior prom. The more money that was made, the more badass the event was. What if the money at the end of the year, if it is enough, we get to hang out at Disney or something could be a party. We could hang out at the theme park, a cruise. You know what? Let's do this. When the time comes to start planning, we will do a drawing. Yeah, let's do a drawing. One person will win $150 and we will bring that party to the person's city. The money will be used to bring myself and the out of place crew to that city. We could rent a space, more than likely a hotel with good security. We'll just have a big party and we'll set up a live show. That person who won gets to hang out with us the whole fucking time and be a part of the live show. So basically the money is for a huge party for all of us. Tell me what you think on Facebook or Twitter. Comment on the posts you see when I'm talking about this episode. Let me know if you like the idea or maybe you have a better idea. I just want the money to go where we're just all hanging out at least once a year. And depending on the money, maybe it'll be, you know, every other. I I don't know. I've also noticed that the out of place community is growing. I just wanted to do something that brings us all together. Um, I want to also get better at communicating with you guys. So comment or message me privately and I will respond as quickly as I could. I fucking love you guys. You all always make my day with the most kindliest words. It gets me excited to bring the next episode. Thank you for listening to Out of Place Episode 6. If anything I said in this episode offended you in any way, I don't give a damn and a half. Cry in the comments, cry on social media, cry to your mommy, male person, or anybody that will listen to a sensitive snowflake. Just know and understand that no one cares. Want to show off an original or cover song? Have a serious or silly question? Or just want to do some business? You can contact me by filling out the contact form at stephendanielbook.com or find me on social media. To my listeners who made it to the end, I love and appreciate you. Goodbye, and always remember to smile. This podcast was recorded live in a laboratory under scientific conditions, examined by experts declared dangerous and sealed in 12 tons of cement buried in the Nevada desert where, for public safety, it will never be heard again and brought to you by the Department of National Security. So until the next unasked for illegal episode, stay well, stay safe and always be a little bit crazy.